Emotions Matter. Brought to you by EMA.com. That's E M A W W.com. Your solution for emotional intelligence. Welcome to the Emotions Matter Podcast. I'm fortunate to have a brilliant guest with me today, Andrew Jevons. Andrew started his career as a software developer for Quantime, which was a leading cross-tabulation and survey software provider. Andrew has worked in the survey software and market research industry for over 20 years in Europe, the USA, and the Pacific Rim. He is a frequent writer and presenter on all subjects related to surveys, text analysis, and MR. He founded Mass Cognition and is also the developer of LawCore, text management and analysis system which Mass Cognition uses. Welcome, Andrew. It's great to have you with us. Great to talk to you, John. I, I hear in the frozen Midwest. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. So, Andrew, you've worked in survey software in the USA, Europe, and Australasia. You're a periodic presenter at conferences and a writer. Besides that, you have experience in statistics, neuropsychology, psychology, writing and presenting, survey software, and software development in general. So after all things that I've said, the only possible question to start with is, how? How did you manage to be active and successful in so many areas? I appreciate the kind words. I, I wish my bank balance uh, uh, reflected your <laughs> confidence in my success. But um, it's um, really all evolved out of when I was doing postgraduate work uh, in neuropsychology. Um, I was doing a PhD in London. And for Various reasons, one of them being my uh, youthful hubris in trying to do too much when I should have simplified my PhD, I, I eventually left the program and uh, had to do something to uh, pay the rent. What I'd learned during my uh, time as an undergraduate and postgraduate was a lot of statistics and as a postgraduate, a lot of computing. And you have to remember this was in the early 80s. It was quite a long time ago. <laughs> and so... The logical thing for me to do then was to go and get a job. I got a job in a medical research institute in London called the Institute of Neurology. So I did a lot of stats there and, and more computing. And eventually after that, I joined Quantime because at the time, I was very fortunate to learn a language during that period in the Institute of Neurology that was really the hot thing in the early 80s. And it all, it all stemmed from there, really. And I really went into the software industry and it happened to be market research uh, and that's where it all came from. So, you know, and I'd started a couple of companies over the years and I got involved when, you know, people wanted um, somebody who had experience of, in the software and perhaps, you know, wanted an, an entry into America. And that's that's really how it all started. It was very evolutionary, I'm glad to say. So you recently founded Mass Cognition. Tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, the last company I worked for, which was a survey software company called Survey Analytics, very much tried to sell their product to, let's say, the lower end of the market for survey software. A lot of these survey software companies will demand ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year for the software. But there are a huge amount of companies out there that don't have those kind of budget. They can afford a few thousand a year for some decent software, but but that's it. And it struck me that coming out of that experience, that there were probably the same number of companies that didn't have lots of money every month to spend on high level text analytical software. And that really just wanted a per project based flat fee analytical system. Uh, and that's where it came from. One of my interests as well for many years had been text analytics, although it wasn't really very common in years gone by simply because we didn't have the computers, we didn't have the software. There were text analytic languages like things called Snowball and Spitball, uh, but they really couldn't work very well because we didn't have the tech. Well, it turns out now that, that we do have the tech, and I know there are companies that want a sort of cost-affordable solution. Uh, and I, you know, and it was very much on my mind to go back to programming. I kind of got lost in being a CEO and, and that kind of stuff. 
stuff and I kind of got fed up with people. <laughs> and so going back into software was, was really sort of a, a great thing for me. And, and I wanted to see if I could still do it. I, I'd made my business for many, many years uh, writing software, but I'd, uh, you know, I was kind of excited to see what I could do. You just recently published a pretty fascinating study on the tweets that were uh, published during the recent U.S. presidential campaign. And uh, some of that data was pretty telling. Tell us about the analysis of that data and kind of the reaction to the results that you got. Yeah, I started off as part of the Lockwood development. I was interested in doing emotional analysis of text, you know, not necessarily tweets. And this was early in the year when we had what people were terming the Republican clown car. There were so many uh, Republican candidates, it was impossible to keep track of. And I decided to be topical that I start collecting tweets from the presidential candidates and see if I could come up with some sort of analysis of the emotion that was in those tweets. Because po- politics is very emotional. Um, you know, there are, there are very strong, there have been very strong opposing views. So it started with me sort of downloading the tweets periodically from the presidential candidates and, and building up this data set. And over time, it sort of morphed into where I I was using um, some software that's called topic analysis, automated topic analysis. It's a statistical rather than artificial intelligence software. And then I'd applied to speak in a conference in Berlin for a company called, uh, an organization called SMR. And I needed to come up with a paper. And I thought, well, okay, let's see what we can do with these presidential tweets and see if this automated software will bring anything out of interest. Because these statistical techniques and AI techniques are all very well, but unless they work on real life data, unless you can use them and get something meaningful out of the other end of it, it's simply a waste of time. So I analyzed uh, these these tweets and I did get some interesting results in terms of patterns of speech across the candidates. And this is something that reflected what we knew. We knew that different candidates talked about different subjects, had a different rhetorical style, and had different um, opposing political views. So that if the techniques that I was using were any good, they should be able to pull out some of those aspects of the different candidates' campaign messages. So it was really quite interesting when we looked at Donald Trump. I'm I'm going to be apolitical because Trump does have a particular (laughs) rhetorical style. And you could see clearly how this rhetorical style changed once he got the nomination to a different style. All politicians attack each other. Hillary did, um, um, Bernie Sanders did, uh, Ted Cruz did. Uh, and there was, a, there was a topic in there called Stop Everyone, which is basically, you know, every politician saying, you must stop, then pick an opposing politician. Mm-hmm. And in particular in Donald Trump's tweets, before he obtained the nomination, he was dominated uh, his speech was dominated by what I call the I and I uh, category. And let's be honest, it's kind of narcissism. Um, it was talking about <laughs> what he was going to do and who I am and all this sort of stuff. And you saw a, a rather abrupt change once he got the nomination to stop everybody. Mm-hmm. And that actually happened. There were changes in characteristics of, of, of Hillary's tweets, although she she tended to be. You very much got the impression that she was a lot more managed. She was managing her uh, media message or people were managing her media message uh, a lot more than Trump and to a certain extent more than um, Bernie Sanders. That, you know, she wouldn't fly off into sort of different styles very, very quickly and, and they wouldn't last very long. Whereas somebody like Trump was much more likely to suddenly switch rhetorical styles of speaking and use different emotional word patterns as well. Although in that paper, I didn't go into emotional analysis of the different groups. I actually am just publishing a blog pretty soon uh, next week showing some emotional analysis of those different groups. But um, it was pretty fascinating. I mean, one thing that happened, um, Bernie Sanders, for most of his campaign, didn't talk about You've got to go and vote, the sort of get out the vote talk. But when he lost the nomination to Hillary Clinton, there was a huge spike in Bernie Sanders saying something about voting, which was very unusual for him. And you could see the pattern change. Of course, what he was saying was to his followers, I'm quite sure. And if you go back and look at the tweets, he was saying, go out and vote for Hillary. 
<laughs> and, and, and you could see that very clearly in, in the pattern. Uh, there's a purple, I, I have these sort of psychedelic multicolored graphs and the, the purple pattern for Bernie Sanders does a huge spike. So it was very encouraging that we could get, that I could get some sort of verification that this analysis technique uh, actually worked on real world data and it, it would actually show something that was meaningful. What was the what was the public reaction to this? What were kind of uh, comments or input or reaction did you actually get from this? Have you gotten a bunch of reaction from, from Not the study? So much. It didn't get terribly well publicized. That's the nature of the kind of semi uh, academic papers. I do remember in Berlin when I was presenting, one person in, in the question time said, "But but did it help you predict?" who uh, would be elected. And that was a really interesting point because I think that maybe now, having done the study and maybe looking at what happened in the election, and whichever way you look at it, from whichever political persuasion you are, it was a huge upset. Maybe there is something in this kind of analysis in particular, overlaying it with emotion analysis, that will give us an idea of who will win the election or who is winning the hearts and minds of the people, which is ultimately what uh, politicians are trying to do. And I think that the main thing was that the analysis really did pick up on the different rhetorical styles. And that's actually a really important uh, thing for this kind of analysis to give it meaning. I'd love, uh, you know, now would be the time to collect the last three months tweets for Donald Trump and maybe do more of an analysis on, on how those are shifting. Um, I haven't had time to do that, but it's all perfectly feasible. So do you, you consider this this process sort of a an AI process or how do you how do you actually describe what this is and say maybe in 10 years, where do you see this heading? The analytics that I'd used were statistical. And there's a blurred line these days between advanced statistical analysis of text, what they term machine learning analytics of text, and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is pretty old. Um, and and it, one particular branch of artificial intelligence, which is now pretty much the dominant one is neural network theory. And that's been around since 1947. What we weren't able to do, again, similar to text analysis, was to perform analyses using these concepts because we didn't have the computing power. So we're now in sort of a, a whole new world. Hmm. So I, what, I, what I can see and what I would like to work on is using the experience with that kind of tweet analysis to build, if you like, um, a model, uh, a theoretical model of a politician's views, including emotional reactions to different subjects, so that you would be able to say, okay, uh, model, you know, this uh, person said this, what, how would you react based on the analysis you've done of their previous reactions? And I think that's very feasible, that we can start simulating the, um, the reactions the uh, viewpoints and the emotions of someone given enough information about what they write and what they say. And I think that's really what's going to happen in the next 10 years or so for market research and for, um, if you're looking at consumers, that we're going to build synthetic models of a consumer. If you like a synthetic consumer, that you, instead of going out and interviewing 400 people about a new product design, you present it to your synthetic consumer and you get some idea. And new product design is, is, is really the frontier because new NPD research in market research is notoriously bad. <laughs> Somebody who is a very senior executive at a very well-known market research company has commented to me, yeah, pretty much, you know, we toss, it's basically we toss the coin. We don't seem to be able to, to do it very well, which is why a tremendous number of new products actually fail because the, the MPD research really doesn't work. There are companies that are really good at it, but, but there aren't many, and you have to pay a lot of money. So I think the fascinating thing for, say, the next 10 years or so within the arena that we're in, let's say, you know, the, the, the modeling consumers and people's emotional reactions is being able to fuse all these statistical and artificial intelligence algorithms into a synthetic consumer or a synthetic person to be able to get the reactions from the, from the model um, rather than having to go out and, and ask people all these questions or maybe you use it as half validation. So that's where I would say, AI within the market research industry is going within the next 10 years. 
So talk about building the synthetic model. I'm 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 trying to get my head around what how that process works. If you're well, building a user, you're building an individual, a fake individual, I guess is what basically what right. you're talking about, right? At the moment, I'll give you an example. At the moment, there's a particular technique. It's called um, doc to vec, document to vector. And I can say in, with this model, I can say, okay, given the sentence, the cat sat on the mat, pretty, you know, anodyne sentence. I have a couple of cats. They constantly sit on mats, you know. How close is the sentence, the horse sat on the mat to the cat sat on the mat? So how similar is it? Well, it gives me a number. It gives me a numeric value of the similarity. And it turns out that the, the similarity between the horse sat on the mat and the cat sat on the mat is closer than the rock sat on the mat or the baby stood on the mat. So we're beginning to get techniques that can mimic similarity and commonality between statements. They don't have to be use similar words but as you can see a horse is a mammal it's an animal it's sort of alive and that's similar to a baby in a way that a rock isn't because a rock is an inert thing and actually what these networks that then neural networks what these neural networks do is they learn what words can be substituted for another so as you could see you could say well you know how close is the sentence well it sort of sounded okay to me to i like this song and so we can we can present these um networks with sentences and statements and work out semantic mapping between the two so ultimately you could say you could say what do you like lavender flavored beer i don't know why they put lavender in the beer these days i think there's some sort of collective insanity within the brewing industry but you know this this stuff happens and you should in theory be able to see how close it is to a statement like i really like this beer so that's the beginning of simulating uh, if you like the synthetic consumer gotcha so the connection then between this artificial intelligence and emotions as a driver toward something, a purchase or a, a whatever right. it happens to be, right? So EMA is a project that's working to connect those two for the benefit of people. What I'm hearing is this is possibly for the benefit of marketers or could be something else. Is there something in your, you see in the future that actually benefits an individual? Yeah. I mean, automated therapy. I know that sounds terrible. Um, years and years ago, there was a famous um, so-called AI program called ELISA that, you know, you would say, I feel depressed. And it would go, why do you feel depressed? It really wasn't very clever. Um, it wasn't, you know, it really wasn't very good. But um Already, there are chatbots that are using this to deal with customer support and customer survey. And I think that you could see having a more synthetic, a better synthetic system for um, discussing emotions. You know, one of the big things is people say, well, you need to talk it out. Well, you can't always talk things out. You don't always want to talk something out with a person, even with a therapist. Maybe if you could have somewhere where you knew it was a non-judgmental system talking to you, it would help you. Because the truth is, is that um, when you look at all the sort of therapies that are around, and particularly the, the psychoanalytic therapies, pretty much what makes them work is talking to somebody who's empathetic. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what form of therapy. It can be Rogerian, it could be Freudian, it could be Neo-Jungian, it could be Reichian, it could be Adleran, um, Adlerian, I think it is. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the fact that you're talking to a, a sympathetic person that, 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 that shows empathy to you. And maybe for people who, who really can't just talk to anybody, we can set up a system which is empathetic and will work in an empathetic way to help people privately talk through their problems. I think that's, you know, really quite a, a would be quite a useful thing for the world. So you need to create an Oprah Winfrey. Um, I wouldn't <laughs> quite go that far. <laughs> no. I mean, unless we had the AI that, you know, was able to give you a car, then yes, I think that would be really <laughs> wonderful. Uh, but I, I could see that, you know, it would help, particularly when people are dealing with difficult situations, when you're talking to a person perhaps about something that is very hard for you to talk about, like, I don't know, if people get into terrible debt and they, they need to talk to somebody and they feel guilty that they're admitting to a person that they've gotten into this debt, you know, and people do feel guilty about that and they feel that they're being judged by the other person. If we can remove 
in a sense, the person from there and simply have an empathy bot, if you like. It might help them disclose more things. It might help them feel better about themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's really a, a crucial issue, as you say, you know, with your project, that emotion is what drives us every day and what makes us do things and try to achieve things. And some of those emotions are very constructive and some of those emotions are um, can be destructive. You know, part of the reason my career took its arc is that I grew up in what was the British equivalent of the projects and I don't want to go back there. And what drives you is that memory of, you know, yeah, you know, you've got to get out of where you were. And, and whether that's constructive or not is arguable. So we talked a little bit about emotion in this artificial intelligence sort of arena. What emotion do you think is kind of, I would call, impossible to be coded into a machine? And maybe what is something that can't be copied that's kind of only reserved for the human? I was giving that quite a lot of thought this morning, actually. (laughs) And I was trying to come up with, with what I really think that machines couldn't. If we if we developed an understanding of what emotion ease in in a way that we could formalize it and program it. And I was having trouble coming up with any emotion that may be sublimely human because emotions are really uh, adaptive mechanisms. You know, it was very useful that when thousands of years ago you saw a saber-toothed tiger that you had the emotion of fear and you ran away from it. They're very important mechanisms for keeping us alive. We forget that now. We get fear of things that perhaps we shouldn't have, mm-hmm. and that, that's not constructive. But thousands and thousands, millions of years ago, emotions were what kept you alive. They, they you know, you know, if you thought, hey, save us with Tiger, nice kitty, let's go say hello, you're dead. You know, <laughs> um, if it was like save us with Tiger, oh, my God, I have to get out of here, you're going to do much better. So emotions are really important and and psychologists have struggled over the years to to really sort of understand how they what part they play in human cognition. There was one theorist many, many years ago, very obscure, who said, well, maybe emotion is like the, the gasoline of the brain. It drives us to do things. We get reward. We feel happier if we do certain things. And I'm not sure we've got much further than that. Um, emotions are very primitive things. So when you're looking at making an artificial organism, it's hard to exclude all of the emotions because we know that emotions are actually very constructive. It's what makes us go forwards. And this would drive the artificial intelligence in some way. It may be that the artificial intelligence actually has emotions that we don't understand. It could develop emotions that we know nothing of. There, there are qualitative differences between different forms of cognition. We start getting into epistemology here, but, but it could be the other way around. So I'm hearing you talk about some of the other ways that you're using analysis and uh, how this can work. And I think we've touched a little bit on some of the aspects of this in our lives where it can really improve our lives. Dive a little deeper into where you see this improving my life, for instance, as as a user of this technology. Well, the, the whole artificial thing artificial intelligence thing i think in the primary role it's going to have in the next 10 or 20 years is actually of maintenance for instance we're going to have systems that can make sure that the traffic flow is optimal it's very difficult to do very complex problem so you know controlling traffic lights and making sure that traffic is optimally um, rooted in various ways. We're going to have AIs that control all sorts of industrial processes and all sorts of social processes, if you like, where money should be allocated for the maximum benefit of the population and those sorts of things where it's, they're very good at doing this sort of consist- consistency thing. And we, you know, and personally, I could do with an AI looking at my bank account and going, <laughs> hey, what the hell, man? You know, uh, this projected over time means that, you know, blah, 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 this sort of thing. And I think that's where it, it, it is start going to come in. It's going to start taking on a relatively mundane role in, in alerting us to complex situations that we really don't see. So, you know, if you keep spending, you know, 
$200 uh, and you're not thinking about it, the AI is going to come back and say, this is a trend and this is what's going on. And this is where you'll be if you don't do this. I'm sure if you're married, your, your wife or partner would do that. But for those of us that aren't, you know, we need that kind of input. So it's going to be a very, very incremental thing over the next 10, 20 years, I think. But it's going to help us use the resources that we have a lot better. So I'm curious, EMA is doing work that relates emotions with physicality, with things that happen to your body at any given time. How do you see the forward movement of this? Take, for instance, you're at your office and any time during the day and you, you've got your whatever your wearable device is. And what I'm hearing you say is we've got the opportunity at some point in the future for that wearable device to go through some software to match an emotion and then ultimately have this guiding factor of this artificial intelligence that says, you know, John, you are always stressed out between 10 and 11 a.m. in the morning at, you know, when you're at work yeah. and this is going to cause you whatever, you know, I mean, you figure out what that ultimately means. You're going to have a heart attack or, you know, high blood pressure yeah. or whatever happens. Is that the where you see this sort of happening to assist us as humans going forward? Yeah, I think that's a really good example of where it can be very useful. Um, we, we all know people who are slaves to their Fitbits at the moment. You know, um, I didn't do my 10,000 steps a day or, or, or whatever it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's actually going to be a very constructive thing for maintaining people's health. Um, the, the, the concept of telemedicine, that is, you know, monitoring people remotely in terms of their, their um, health is, is rising extremely quickly. And I think that's somewhere where AI can be very, very useful in detecting aberrant movement patterns or, or things like that that predict some sort of uh, medical problem. It does feel a bit like, you know, you're being taken over by the AI. But on the other hand, I think it's going to improve our quality of life physiologically as if, as you say, you know, the, the, the AI system will go, you know, your blood pressure always goes up at this point in the day, as you say, you know, maybe there's something you need to do about that. You know, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that. Uh, and it will be able to collate that information from hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And maybe it comes up with some relationship between the time of day and blood pressure and something else that we simply haven't thought of. Mm hmm. But we simply don't know because we're not able to process that information and, and look at those complex relationships. Humans are great for looking at relationships between three variables. We're basically three-dimensional people. You can sort of do it four-dimensionally if you're lucky. But after that, we can't really comprehend it. <laughs> Whereas an AI might be able to look intelligently at 50 dimensional problem. And the solution to some of our problems may be best on 50 dimensions, but we can't do that. You know, we don't have the mental capacity in our conscious minds to do that. So, uh, well, very few people have, I think, arguably. So this is where AI can really help us without taking over the world, but just helping make our world better, both in our physical and our emotional health. You know, I always, I always say everybody should go to therapy because we've all got something. We've all got some aberrant emotional reaction to something that's probably hurting our lives. And maybe, you know, the AI can look at that as well. Well, let's look at the other side of the coin. Actually, one of our listeners, Norman from Chicago, he wants to know what you think about automating the industry or, you know, automation in industry. How do you see the threat he believes we're about to face where... You know, a person can lose their job to a machine or software. Well, of course, this is already happening. It's very traumatic for somebody involved in this situation when they lose their job to a machine or some software system. You know, a devastating effect on someone's self-worth. You know, you've been replaced by a, by a robot. It is really the second industrial revolution that we're going through, I think, when we have these kinds of automated systems taking over jobs that, that people would normally be doing and would do all, the, do all their lives and, and, you know, support their families with. I think it's an inevitability, unfortunately, if you look at the rise of the cotton spinning industry in, in, in the industrial north of England in previous centuries. That had a tremendously negative effect on the population there as the traditional cottage work were moved into large mills and it became very industrialized and the conditions were very bad. And I think this is really a, um, a, an imminent threat to, to the structure of our society. What we have to come up with is, is ways of retraining people who are over 45. If you're under 45, you're relatively 
flexible um, and you may not take it too hard. You can think about having another career. But if you're over 50, it's a very different matter. And I think this is where we, we really have to concentrate on looking at what can we do to improve people's lives. And that includes their emotional lives and sort of saying, well, look, it's not that you're worthless that you got replaced by a piece of software. It's just that this is a part of progress. And we have to find some of the thing that you're interested in that we can give you a job. While we're getting a lot of rise of automation, it's hard to automatically put solar panels on houses. Mm-hmm. There's no machines that can do that. Maybe this, maybe one set of technology that actually has to be labor intensive, like renewable energy, is able to replace some of those jobs that are industrial jobs that are going away because they are those jobs are able to be automated. I think we've got to pay very careful attention, and I think this could be a great disruptor. Um, this this is the real sort of crisis of our age. I feel. So you did mention the next thing that I was considering from your research. Have you noticed or observed any specific generational differences? If you say if you you talk about millennials versus baby boomers versus Gen Y generation or Gen Xers. Have you noticed any in your research, any differences from from those generational differences? Not specifically, but I I think that um, I can remember when um, British people couldn't tell the difference between the Democrat and the Republican parties. We couldn't tell. (laughs) I I remember thinking, well, and I can remember thinking, well, how are these two parties different? But of course, we know what the differences are now. They've become tremendously polarized. I would, on anecdotal evidence, say that this that the younger people tend to be more emotional in that they express it. And maybe they can express it more via social media, via Snapchat or, or Twitter. The younger generation don't use Facebook. That's for anybody over 50 now. You know, They're not interested in that. <laughs> but, you know, if you look at Snapchat, I happen to use it because I have a daughter that uses it. There are lots of these things on Snapchat called filters, which allow you to enhance your image, you know, make you look like a cat or sort of all this sort of stuff. And to my mind, this is sort of a subconscious way of expressing emotion in the pictures mm-hmm. that they want to add something to that picture or, or, or video that gives you an idea of how they're feeling and so i think the expression of emotionality is is becoming more kind now obviously i'm I originally british you know and the rule about emotion in britain is you don't have it and you certainly don't talk about it <laughs> uh, and that has changed over the years i mean uh not greatly but it has changed I think that's a very constructive thing if people express their emotions more. Well, all right. So uh, we're running a little bit short of time, but uh, I wanted to ask you, so with an outstanding professional bio that you already have, is there something else you plan to achieve? What's your next goal or milestone that you you want to get to, you want to reach? Oh, I always have something. Actually, I've always been very interested in uh, semiotics, which is understanding the system of signs that we use when we communicate you know why would we use a certain word or image to say certain things Uh, and i think this can be the next frontier in text analytics in that we do some form of automated semiotic analysis and so that's what i call computational semiotics that's something that i you know really want to have a look at i need to finish off a lot more with the software uh, and i think i want to get back to my hobbies I've, I've been very focused on software development and i think i need a bit of relief so uh, that's that's another ambition all right terrific well andrew it has been a real pleasure to chat with you today well, and, thank you very much and thank you again for your time with us thanks it's great for more information about andrew and mass cognition please visit his website www.masscognition.com. This is John, and I look forward to being with you again on another episode of the Emotions Matter podcast.